Yesterday, the new Secretary of State for the Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero gave her first public speech since taking up the role. It was at the Conservative Conference Party. And I'm going to quickly run through what she said, what it means for us and what I think was missing in that speech. Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Winslow with Over 50s Money. Um, if you want to keep getting these energy videos, please subscribe to the Over 50s Money YouTube channel and turn on the notifications. So it's just clicking the little bell in the bottom right hand corner. Um, that way you'll get notified as soon as we post a new video. Thank you. Okay, so yesterday, Claire Coutinho, the new Secretary of State for the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero, gave her first public appearance and public speech since taking up the role a month or so ago. Um, it was at the Conservative Conference Party, and in it she announced a few new policies um, that we haven't heard before, as well as spending five, ten minutes berating Labour and making jokes. So I want to quickly run through what she did announce that's actually useful and how that might impact us in the future. I want to talk about what was missing in that video, uh, in that speech, and what I would like to see from other parties and from the Conservatives going forwards to give me some sense of security in our energy industry going forwards. So the three things that she mentioned is that there will be an increase of £80 million per year in the funding for, for social housing energy efficiency. There will be a, a breakthrough of red tape on the installation of solar panels on businesses, so on factories and uh, large company buildings. And they are also moving forwards with a project to install small modular reactors in the UK. They've got about six bidders on a contract for that at the moment to start installing small modular reactors. So the first thing was the £80 million increase per year for social housing energy efficiency. It's a positive step. I am absolutely for it. It is a small step. It's not a lot of money. £80 million is nothing to our government. Okay, that's effectively all of us paying one pound a year that's in taxes. And we all know we pay way more than that. So like it's not a lot of money. Um, they will be able to help around maybe at a push 8000 homes a year. There are 30 million homes in the UK. So it's a small portion of our houses that are being helped. However, social housing tends to be lower income households or those with um, people with vulnerabilities. And so I do think it's a very positive step and they should be doing it, but I would like to see more money per year being put into that than just 80 million. They can help a lot more people. There's a lot more people out there that need the help. Um, and if you're meant to be protecting those that are less well off and vulnerable, then actually protect all of them, not just a very small portion. Um, but yeah, still it's a positive step and I'm not gonna knock it too much. I hope that they do reconsider the amount of funding and increase that. The second point was on the solar panels for businesses. Again, I'm extremely supportive of it. It's a green energy initiative um, that we should be doing. I don't understand why there is red tape around it. If there's large factories across the country that could have solar panels on top. Install them. Start getting some more green energy. Why not? The other side reason for them wanting to do this is to take pressure off local councils who are being told not to install onshore wind farms because they're aesthetically unpleasing to the local communities and people want to keep our great British countryside as beautiful as possible. Whilst I understand the sentiment of wanting the countryside to be pretty, I think it's more important that we address the, the global concerns for our environment um, and also our our energy crisis that we're in it's 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 a huge problem and it needs to be addressed as quickly as possible and i think putting onshore wind farms is a positive step so i don't want them to be harsher against onshore wind farms just because they're installing solar panels on top of businesses i think both need to be done claire did point out in her speech that we own the four biggest offshore wind farms in the world but for reference it's important to note that we're actually only the sixth biggest producer fifth sixth biggest producer of wind energy in the world uh, spain produces more than us germany produces twice as much as us china produces 12 times as much as us we're not as good as oh, we've got the top four just because we've got the top four offshore wind farms doesn't mean we're one of the top four producers of wind energy in the country in the world we're not 
And there's more we could be doing, and we need onshore wind farms to do that. That's why these countries produce more wind energy than us, because they've got massive onshore wind farms. Um, and, you know, we're a windy country. We should be able to produce a lot of wind energy. So, yeah, I don't think they should stop with wind, wind energy or onshore wind farms just because they're putting solar panels on top of businesses. The third point about uh, small modular reactors um, that's a really exciting thing. I had to Google what that was, didn't, hadn't heard of them before. Effectively, they're mini power plants, power stations, um, and they have a ton of benefits that regular sized power stations don't have. So first of all, they're smaller. They don't look as bad. That's great. Um, they are much cheaper to produce and install. Um, they're safer. They don't need refueling as often, anywhere near as often. Um, so regular power station needs refueling every one to two years. Uh, the small modular ones, need refueling every sort of three to seven years, but some of them are build, built specifically to last up to 30 years without refueling. So that's great. They have lower carbon emissions. Um, they're just all around better. They can slot into better places as well. So the big power stations need a lot of planning permission and generally they're, they're custom built for the area that they're being built. Um, and that means that we need to get grid connectors out to them. So there's a lot more regulation there and it's a lot more work and it leads to more delays whereas these smaller ones can be built on top of infrastructure that already exists and just plugged into the grid so yeah there's a lot more benefit to having these smaller power plants um she didn't say or imply in any way that if we vote labor we won't get these um, but they were just talking about like some of the things the conservatives are doing which is they've currently got six companies bidding for contracts to install these um, one of which are Rolls-Royce, a British company, which is great. But there's also five other um, massive global companies that are bidding for it. And hopefully that should be underway fairly soon. So whether we vote Conservative or Labour, I assume that will still go ahead. And that will be good for our energy industry. Now, uh, on top of that, the only other overarching theme that was mentioned uh, that's worth pointing out is how they're taking a different approach to net zero to Labour. So... The implication, or what she explicitly said in some cases, was that Labour are going with a very short-term, quick, do it now, rip the plaster off, let's get green, let's get hit net zero as quickly as possible approach. Um, I haven't read anything from Labour's manifestos. I haven't seen any of their videos. I don't know whether to agree with that statement or not, if that's what they're actually saying. And obviously this could have all been contorted differently to get a message across that she wanted to get across for her party. Um, so I'm not saying Labour are saying that. I'm saying she's saying Labour saying that. Um, but... Conservatives are saying to take it slow and steady and that the reason they're rolling back their targets for a lot of green policies is because they want to keep people on board. They believe if you force people into doing something um, at a greater expense to them, then you'll lose the support of the people and it will end negatively. And I actually agree with that notion. It's something I've been saying for a long time. We need to, to keep people on board. People need to be comfortable in their own position first. Um, if my bills are back to a thousand pound a year or 800 pound a year for my energy and you tell me you're going to add 100 quid to help reach a net zero green target i'm not too fast but if my bills are still triple what they were two years ago and you're now adding even more i'm going to get a bit madder about that and i think that's a general consensus across the country so i agree with the idea of taking it slower and steadier and making sure people are on board with the changes and can afford the changes as they come is a good idea that being said, I'm not 100% sure I believe that the Conservatives will continue that way or that's purely their motives. Obviously, there's going to be more profit in it for fossil fuel producers for longer if it takes longer to get to green energy. Um, but that's neither here nor there. I would like to say at this point that I'm not trying to sway your vote one way or another on Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dems or any other party. And nor will I with this video or any other video. I'm, this is not political uh, channel. This is not a political company. I have no political affiliation. I'm not even certain which way I'm voting yet. My vote will be based on energy policies that each party puts forwards. I will probably tell you what, which way I'm going to vote and why based on their energy policies, but I will not try and sway you one way or another. Our political system works because we all look at the policies that each party are offering. We decide what we think will be best for our family, our community and our country, and then we vote. And the the party with the most votes wins and i think that works so i don't want to try and sway you to vote one way or another all i will ever do is give you information and maybe rant about politics in general because obviously those of you that follow me know i have as much trust in the government as i do in ofgen 
So apologies for those rants when they come. Um, but yes, please don't try to, don't, please don't think I'm trying to persuade your political affiliation one way or another. I'm not. Um, and if you ever feel I am, please leave comments, send me emails, correct me. I'll take down the video. I'll delete, I'll issue an apology. But yeah, I'm not trying to sway you one way or another. Just making that clear. The other thing I wanted to mention in this video, and the main part for me, is the stuff that was missing from this speech. So there was a lot in there attacking Labour and a lot of jokes. And she was very jo like jovial with it, which I wasn't a fan of, if I'm being perfectly honest. I didn't like how jovial my new Secretary of State was in her first public speech about energy. It's a very serious topic at the moment. And our bills have tripled. I want my Secretary of State to take it as seriously as I do. I don't want someone up there making jokes. So, yeah, that I thought was a bad move personally. It didn't fill me with confidence. Um, it, it felt me more with rage than anything because I was like, you need to take this seriously. It's a serious matter. Um, but on top of that, there was no mention of the current problems and addressing those problems. So a lot of talk about wind energy. That's great. But as my sister pointed out to me earlier or reminded me of earlier, and it's a very apt point. Our wind farm system at the moment doesn't work. We currently pay wind turbines to turn off if our grid can't take the energy because we've bought too much energy from nuclear power stations. There's not enough space on the grid. It's not being used quick enough. We've bought loads from the nuclear power stations. That has to be supplied to the grid straight away. So we turn off our wind farms. So what's the purpose in building new ones? We need a better grid, a better system that allows all of the green energy that's being produced to actually be used when it's being produced. So that's the first problem that needs to be addressed. The second problem is the pricing. Green energy isn't cheaper for us. Now, you'll hear a lot about green energy being cheap. It's cheaper to produce. No one tells you it's cheaper to buy because it's not. Because green energy is sold at wholesale price and wholesale price on our electricity system is one price for every piece of electricity that is used. Every piece of electricity, every unit of electricity that is purchased at wholesale cost is purchased at one cost, which is the highest cost of any producer. So all of this wind energy and solar power energy is being charged to our energy suppliers from wholesale producers at the cost of gas fuel power stations. So the producers of green energy get huge profit margin because they have a low cost with the same sales price as gas fuel, uh, gas fueled power stations. That system can't continue. Otherwise, we get no financial benefit of green energy and we still bear the costs of green energy production. Like all of these renewable obligations that energy suppliers have are passed on to us in the price cap. The wholesale cost energy, uh, the wholesale cost of energy is passed on to us in the price cap. Everything is passed on to us, but not the reduced cost of production. We don't get the benefits of a reduced cost. So secondly, they need to ad address our energy wholesale system. And thirdly, I think we need some regulation on the wholesale energy market. There's just not just a wholesale energy market, I think we need some more regulation on every step of the energy market. There's regulation on the suppliers, but they're just the last the last step in the energy production system. They, they supply to us and they're the ones that we deal with face-to-face -face effectively. You talk to British Gas or Octopus Energy or OVO or whoever you're with, you talk to them, but you don't see all the other steps where there's no regulation on costs and there's still profits. So our national grid, for example, 80% owned by Australian investment conglomerates. And those investment conglomerates want profit. So there's profit on the actual grid. There's uh, the wholesale energy producers, some of which are obviously UK based, others are abroad, and they all want profits. Um, again, all of the uh, wind turbines and solar powered uh, solar panels, they need their profits. Um, all of the wires and transmission lines, all of the battery storage for energy, they, the, the silos, they all need profits and all of those profits ultimately are borne by the customer. We bear all the profits because at the end of the day, all of those costs are paid by the wholesale, or by the um, energy suppliers who then sell to us. That's how all of these little steps add up. Wherever they sell energy, there's profits being made. It works its way through to the energy supplier who has that final cost they pass all of that cost on to us, and that's the only place that it's regulated. So, yeah, I think we need to address those problems first. 
and then look at some of these other issues. Net zero is an important target for all of us, but we need to address the key problems that already exist today. You need to protect consumers today before we can get on board with looking at the future. So yeah, that's my just that's just my two cents worth. Um, at the very least, I hope it was interesting. Uh, I, I'm hoping to see more from our new Secretary of State, and I'm hoping to see her take the job more seriously and take these problems more seriously and to address them. I will be sending her a letter regarding that speech. I think it's important that we have communication with the Department of Energy, uh, Energy Security and Net Zero so that they understand what we think they're doing right and what we think they're doing wrong and where the problems lie and how they can help us going forward. If no one's telling them, they won't know. So I'm going to tell them what I think the problems are and hope that they take it on board and hopefully we'll see something in their manifestos. Once it's in their manifestos and once it's put online, hopefully, obviously, other parties will see it and we can see some policies that will benefit us today, not just in 20, 30, 40 years time. Uh, yeah, as I said, I hope all of that was helpful. If you do want to keep seeing these energy videos, please like and subscribe to our 50s Money YouTube channel. Um, and just before you switch off the video, uh, just so you know, I'll probably be posting another video shortly about the latest off consultation. They've posted a letter about the additional wholesale energy cost allowance. Um, they're doing a review. They've pushed back the con consultation a little bit, but they've posted a letter with some of their thoughts and a variety of questions um, to help sculpt the consultation when it is released in late November, early December. So once once I've posted this video, I'll do another video about that letter. I'll respond to their letter next week um, and then do another video so you know what my answers are and how you can get in contact with Ofgym to let them know. Anyway, that's everything. I'm sorry this was a really long video. Hope I didn't ramble too much. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the uh, comment section below or my email address, as always, is in the description, so feel free to email me. Thank you.